Hare Krishna, dear devotees. Please accept my humble obeisances. All glories to his divine grace, Srila Prabhupada. Thank you for joining us today for the Books Are the Basis Week Festival. In this video, we have the opportunity to hear from His Holiness Swayam Bhagwan Keshava Swami and His Grace Chaitanya Charan Prabhu on the Bhagavad Gita as it is. I hope that this podcast will inspire you to read Srila Prabhupada's books every day. Please subscribe to our YouTube channel and access hundreds of such inspirational videos. And if you know a friend who is keen on this topic of reading Srila Prabhupada's books regularly, invite them too. So now on to the video. All glories to Bhagavad Gita as it is. Hare Krishna, Krishna. Hare Krishna, Chaitanya Charan Prabhu. My best and sis to you. Uh, Congratulations on your sannyas. Nice to see you now. Thank you so much. <laughs> All right. The entire devotee community, especially our generation, is thrilled to see you take this step forward. And my best wishes and prayers to you for this. Thank you so much. Your more and more. Mm. I'm delighted to be yeah, here. Yeah, it's been an eventful few months and uh, I've been traveling a little bit more and exploring the new opportunities that uh, the ashram has to uh, offer me and uh, yeah, praying that I can become a better instrument in Shri Prophet's movement. So thank you. And uh, welcome to all our viewers today. We are um, here today having a discussion as part of the glorification of Srila Prabhupada's books and um, today we're specifically speaking about the Bhagavad Gita and the importance of the Bhagavad Gita in our life, what the Bhagavad Gita is really giving us um, as sadhakas on the spiritual journey and we're also uh, looking at how to delve deeper into the Gita to uh, draw fresh inspiration, deeper insights, and um, more and more wisdom, which, uh, which we can use to enrich our Gita as one of our key scriptures through which we can uh, reach the world with very powerful um, uh, and relevant wisdom. And so... Um, of course, uh, Chaitanya Charan Prabhu needs no introduction. Uh, he's uh, a, a, a renuncia for many years, a preacher uh, in recent years, has been traveling more and more um, across the world. He's the author of many, many books. He has his online uh, podcast and his website, The Spiritual Scientist, um, and today, specifically, Chaitanya Charan Prabhu is uh, one of the ideal personalities to have this conversation with because uh, he's, uh, he's written, uh, I think, probably close to 2,000 articles on the Bhagavad Gita. Would that be correct, Chaitanya Charan Prabhu? Well, I've been writing for 11 years now, so it's uh, about 4,000. Oh, 4,000. I got, I was half. Okay, so 4,000 articles on the Bhagavad Gita, his uh, Gita Daily. Uh, it's usually about a three to 400 word article, which gives a very uh, practical but deep um, wisdom insight into one of the verses. And, um, and he's recently uh, taken some of that material and produced two new books, um, which he'll be sharing a little bit with us later on based on Srila Prabhupada's Gita and how to derive more from it. So um, we'll be discussing a little bit about, about this today. Um, Chaitanya Chambra, let me ask you, um, devotees read Shastra and then they go to deeper and deeper levels. Oftentimes we find that the Bhagavad Gita is taken by devotees as kind of an introductory book to get familiar with the basics of Krishna consciousness. And then later on, when they go to reading the Bhagavatam or perhaps the CC and other books, that's where they tend to spend more time like going deeper into the commentaries and 
um, studying to different levels. But it's interesting that yourself um, for you know, two to three decades, you've been studying the Gita and the Gita remains um, a, a big focus for you, a big focus of contemplation, reflection and study. Um, that's quite unique. Um, can you tell us something about why the Gita remains uh, a book that uh, is capturing your imagination clearly? Thank you, Prabhu. Yes, no, oh, frankly, the Bhagavad Gita was the book which captivated me. I could say my relationship with the Bhagavad Gita has had four different stages. I like to visualize the verses of the Gita as, as my close friends. I mean, it's a little presumptuous and sacrilegious. But just as we, when we, if we have some difficulties, we turn to our friends for insights. So like that. So in my childhood, I studied, I won't say I studied, I recited the Gita, I memorized the Gita. I was born in a pious Indian family. So it is a part of a shloka recitation competitions. And that was, okay, this is something nice, something like nice, sweet and nice to recite. I didn't think of it as a source of meaning or wisdom or life guidance at that time. Then second stage was when I was introduced to Shla Prabhupada's Gita. Actually, I had read a few Gitas. I started a little bit of a philosophical search in my life uh, when I was around 15, uh, when my mother passed away of cancer. So I had read a few Gitas before I read Prabhupada's Gita. And when I read Prabhupada's Bhagavad Gita as it is, it struck, what struck me were two things, the clarity and the consistency, which was amazing that the Bhagavad Gita was a, is, can be a very confusing and complex book. Hmm? So, but I found Prabhupada's explanation so clear and so consistent. And it became very clear to me that this is what I would like to study. This is what I'd like to share. I found that the Gita helped me, you could say, find my calling in my life. I never really thought that I became a brahmachari in one sense. It was, I, I never think, I thought that, okay, I'm choosing to become a brahmachari. I thought that I am studying the Gita. I want, to, I want to study the Gita further. I want to share it. And the best place to do it is the brahmachari ashram. So in that sense, becoming a brahmachari was secondary. Even joining ISKCON was secondary. It was more studying the Gita. And I would say it's not only the Gita, but the wisdom surrounding the Gita. Because I see the Gita like a, like a center point and like a nucleus. And around which you can have many, many areas where we could uh, explore. So that was for me. Shri Prabhupada's Gita became like the main guiding light for my life. Mm -hmm. That was the second stage. Then the third stage was where I started reading previous Acharya's commentaries on the Gita. And I started realizing, hey, there are similarities, but there are, sub there are substantial differences also. Not in terms of conclusions, but in terms of analysis. And then that's when I started, I read Prabhupada's well-known quote, you know, study scriptures scrutinizingly from multiple perspectives. Mm. So when I studied Priya Sacharya's commentaries, I started finding that each verse could have so many uh, layers and levels of meaning. Now at present, so then that was the third stage where I was exploring the Gita, you could say from multiple perspectives. And I won't say these stages are entirely discrete. Because I keep studying Prabhupada's Gita, I keep reading uh, Priya Sachara's commentaries also. So, first, uh, so, uh, but the third, after the third stage came the fourth stage where I became convinced that the Gita will be the basis of what I want to share in the world. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, I do, of course, speak on the Bhagavatam and the CC, but the Gita is the center of my both in reach and outreach. I hope to reach, come closer to Krishna the Gita and to help others come uh, closer. And within that, so that particular theme of statement of Prabhupada, so two statements of Srila Prabhupada. The one is a study scripture from scrutinizing from multiple perspectives and every day write your realization. So I would say those two statements have been the driving force for me in, in my study, my analysis, my presentation, 
and my uh, writing of course so yeah i hope to be continue on in the fourth stage lifelong krishna willing yeah i mean to write 4000 articles it means you're constantly finding newer and newer insights and this is something i want to ask you it is kind of fascinating to me like um in analyzing and drawing lessons from the gita uh how creative can we get how do we know when we kind of coming up with something uh based on our kind of creative imagination how do we know like okay let me give you an example i was reading your new book and um and in the very first chapter i think you talk about dhritarashtra and you ask the question which is a very interesting question as to why does the bhagavad gita begin with dhritarashtra uvacha and the lesson that you draw from there if i understood it correctly and i remember correctly is you explain that it's not just a contextual thing that okay dhritarashtra is in the palace and he's hearing um from sanjay and therefore the gita begins like that but we could also take it a little deeper and see that dhritarashtra his personality is outlined at the beginning the very first verse of the gita so that the reader can understand what kind of mentality not to have because if you have this kind of mentality you never really grasp the message of the gita and so it's almost like the gita begins with a a warning of not to be like this person because that will block you from absorbing the message uh, did i understand that point did i convey it correctly yes true thank you for bringing that example yes. so so i was just wondering when it comes to things like this um for example an insight like that did you get that from the commentaries do you get that how did you how did you what was that process by which you came okay. up with that insight that's a, yeah. that's a, thank you so okay so currently my favorite metaphor for understanding the gita or approaching the gita is it's a jigsaw puzzle and it's a extraordinary jigsaw puzzle because a normal jigsaw puzzle it's challenging because you have to get each piece in the right place and then it all fits together to give a attractive picture but the gita is such a jigsaw puzzle that you can fit the pieces in different ways and each of those times you get a attractive picture now of course the attractive picture so chakravarti pad has fit his fit the gita's pieces by pieces i mean verses concepts chapters it's it put them together and he has got a pictorial picture emerging from the gita baldev vidya bhushan who is considered his disciple he has put the gita together in a very different way in fact although some verses they explain similarly their overall frame of analysis is very different and yet the picture that ultimately comes is there are two two things which are consistent so that is and this is where i find shri prabhupad's uh, clarity and consistency so empowering that ultimately the gita is about sadhan and sadhya that's one of the last articles in that book which you mentioned that you know, what is the purpose of the gita is to tell arjuna both contextually and universally for all of us that okay what is the purpose to achieve in life what is the sadhya and what is the means to achieve that purpose? what is the sadhan so shri prabhupad throughout his gita commentary is bhagavad gita as it is is very consistent right in the introduction shri prabhupad said our purpose in writing this gita and this commentary on the gita is the same as the purpose of krishna in descending to this world thousands of years ago and what is that to establish these two truths what is the sadhan what is the sadhya the sadhya is bhagwan aham sarvasya prabho as arjuna himself says that sarvam eta dritam manya i accept what you say as true and then what is the sadhya so what is sadhan that is bhakti karishye vachanam tava i will do your will so if these two points we keep in mind so in the relishing bhagavad gita book what i did is shri prabhupad consistently emphasizes that bhakti is the conclusion that actually krishna's love 
is manifesting and he emphasizes bhakti very very clearly so i was thinking that how best to 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 understand this and to convey this and shri prabhu pat talks about the difference between say philosophical speculation and mental speculation and it could be understood in different ways uh, the way i put it i mean the way prabhupad explains it but the, okay i put it concisely is that that philosophical speculation means ar- seek different ways to arrive at the desired conclusion or at the specified conclusion so we have scope for endless in one sense that's the whole gamut of bhakti also is it we are what we are meant to do with our life is to serve krishna we are his parts we are meant to serve him but how we serve him there is abundant room for individuality individual initiative individual creativity individual even liberty if we use that word so similarly in the study of scripture we come to the final conclusion so and how exactly what process of reasoning we use that is uh, that is uh, something which i feel we have our own god given abilities and uh, what i did was i was always interested in literature and in the last few years i have studied quite a few books about the structure of books so when a book is written okay how is the author writing a book why is the author starting from this perspective why is the author taking this angle say when we when you study the, as a author you study the structure we write books so we structure our books but when you study writing we see the structure of books and then that itself becomes a fascinating study you know, why is krishna putting so many verses for this so few verses for this why is the gita starting here so my understanding is at that particular point now coming to the specific example of dhritarashtra so it is that if you see the gita starts with that frame and it ends also with that frame sanjay is speaking with dhritarashtra so towards the end of it dhritarashtra's heart is not changed so in one sense that that is saying that this is the this is so okay one important point i say is that this is one way to fit the bhagavad gita bhagavad gita jigsaw puzzle i'm not saying that is the only way and there are many different ways to fit it and adishyate cha yaimam dharmam samvad mavayo jnana yagyena tena aham ishtasyam iti me mati that we worship krishna with our intelligence when we study the gita in this way now i have basically i take an inspiration from both chakravarti pad and baldev dakshin commentaries and not just see the points that they make but try to understand the reasoning by which they make those points so and i have talked with various senior devotees who have commented on the gita so for example chakravarti pad may give a particular reason why a particular name is used for krishna at a particular point say like prabhupad says uh he says keshi like a demon keshi sudana inesh ni sudana that doubts are like demons and krishna arjuna is requesting krishna please kill the demon of doubt in my heart now these these meanings they give at particular places at other places they may not give the meanings but if that name has been used and if we can find out from with our god given intelligence okay how does this name make sense and i feel it enhances the appreciation for the gita so for example the last word that arjuna that krishna uses to refer to arjuna is dhananjaya kachchit eja sudam parto ekagrena jitasa kachchit agyana sammoha pranashtaste dhananjaya that's 1872 the last word dhananjaya is the winner of wealth so the way i felt inspired to uh, the way i understood this was that krishna is asking arjuna you are the winner of wealth you won physical wealth have you now won the spiritual wealth of the wisdom of the gita that oh dhananjay have you understood clearly has your illusion been dispelled so have you have you been enriched arjuna with this wisdom so the gita's wisdom is meant to make all of us dhananjay in that sense so now in that sense i follow not necessarily the exact everything that i write in my books may not be specified specifically said in the previous acharya's commentaries but i follow their way of reasoning and then i i use as prabhupada's philosophical speculation to analyze from different perspectives 
Wonderful. Yeah, it, it's interesting that, you know, that, you know, one way is that we go to the commentaries and then we derive the lessons that the, that the Acharyas have brought to our attention. But here what you're saying is that if you see the text, you can use your intelligence. If you come with an insight as to, you know, a deeper lesson that's contained within the text, if it's um, in line with the Acharya's way of thinking, it follows the uh, Siddhanta of Guru Sada Shastra, and if it illuminates the ultimate sadhya and sadhana that the Gita is trying to establish, then we can accept that that insight is bona fide and useful and enriching to our spiritual journey. Yes. Uh, I feel... Otherwise, what do we mean by study from different perspectives? Prabhupada said that so we have our experience, we have our, our understanding, we have our God as Krishna has given us our intelligence. And we will see things from a particular perspective. When we say bodhayanta parasparam, that's where I see from my perspective, you see from your perspective. So the boundary would be that I would never contradict anything that a previous Acharya has said. It can give a different perspective. So for example, 110. The, the word aparyaptam, chakravarti pad and baldev devotion give different meanings of that. So aparyaptam, chakravarti pad says that actually he means it's insufficient. And baldev devotion says it means impeasurable. Duryodhana is comparing the two armies. So there could be sometimes different perspectives, but that does not necessarily mean that one is right and the other is wrong. It is just like the classic example is another example, another point for this is that the 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 64 meanings of the Atma Ram verse that Mahaprabhu himself gives. The idea is that uh, there is within our tradition a lot of room, not just room, a lot of precedent for the use of intelligence in understanding scripture. And um, to the extent we uh, to the extent we study scripture, it's like Scripture is a manifestation of Krishna. And it's, it's, if we understand it's not different from Krishna, and each one of us has our personal relationship with Krishna. So each one of us has a personal relationship with Scripture. And as I said, this is, this is a perspective. I find it enriching. Others may find it enriching. And I find it enriching not just in my sense of, oh, I am so clever, I am understanding the Gita. I find it deepens my appreciation of Krishna. It deepens my absorption in Krishna. It deepens my conviction of how Srila Prabhupada has been so brilliant in emphasizing what he has emphasized in his Gita commentary. So, Falena Parichayate, we can say. Now, this particular frame of analysis, will it necessarily ex help everyone? Well, no, it is, it is a matter of, I would say, it is a matter of, see, there is, there is realizations. And what is a realization for me? may not seem that striking a realization for someone else. And that's perfectly fine. So I find fitting the jigsaw puzzle quite intriguing. And it's it's quite intellectually fascinating, actually, and fascinating and fulfilling. Yeah, I was thinking many people would read the same verse as what you read, and they may not see what you see. And of course, you said Krish, the Shastra is Krishna, it's all individual. Um, but clearly, you have been gifted with an ability to draw many things from scriptures, draw many insights that maybe others, many of us, would not be able to see. And I'm just wondering whether um, there's anything that you've observed in your own life which makes you more able to discover such things, like... Uh, you know, what, what is it that, what, what's the difference between two people who read the Gita and someone who feels like they're reading, but they're not able to draw that kind of uh, insight. And another person who seems to just be bombarded with more and more thoughts and um, realizations. What, what, what's the difference? Well, first of all, I say that we all are individuals. So for example, uh, I did a Gopi Gita podcast with Amarendra Prabhu and Madhvanand Prabhu. And I have studied the Gopi Gita. It's one of my favorite sections of the Bhagavatam. But 
the kind of insights they have now they both studied the acharya's commentary i also studied to some extent but when they were sharing it is not just the acharya's commentaries they check the acharya's commentaries and they're going giving their own insights their own realizations so my understanding is with respect to the bhagavatam many devotees do it and that's what also makes bhagavatam relishable with respect to various past times so prahlad past time or many other past times which we discuss you know we do we do bring in uh, our understanding our realization our perspective when we study the bhagavatam and in chaitanya charitam also some devotees do it um, but i feel it is krishna attracting us to different different ways and uh, maybe when i go in front of the deities now i don't get navanavara sadhamanya in that when i go in front of the deities but somebody is a pujari they go in front of the deities they get that much more and somebody who is worshiping the deities so it's krishna krishna in one sense gives us gives all of us something within krishna consciousness that we are attracted to uh, having said that i would say that see you also have a lot of insights on the gita in your um, in the way you present it and especially if at various places i have traveled in the way you made acronyms initially for various sections of the gita that's a that's a brilliant way of making the gita accessible accessible memorable relishable so it's i would say i could ask it how did you get that idea of making an acronym like that it's just something that comes isn't it you just oh you get this acronym it really works we try sometimes okay this is not fitting do this try this but the way i find acronyms is you don't really sit down and try to come up with acronym it's not that you six hours you're sitting down to come up with acronym i don't know if that's how you work if you think about a subject but suddenly the acronym comes at a particular time and it fits we may do a little bit juggling about a little bit fixing tinkering but overall this is uh, krishna i think if the, the, for me i see uh, i physically i'm not able to do much deity worship so i see words as my way of worshiping krishna just as a pujari would try to put flowers in the most artistic beautiful way to they don't beautify the deities but they make the beauty of the de- deities manifest to our vision so this is there is creativity in that okay you could put the put the flower decoration like this you could make the effulgence like this you could make the garland like this uh, uh, so just as there is the way of review of manifesting krishna's beauty by decorating with flowers there could be manifesting krishna's beauty by offering him words so i would say my my focus is not so much on fresh insights as fresh way of phrasing the insights so some some of course are there as fresh insights but i i i like to think of the teachings of the gita and then present them in a way that become easily memorable so what i think what you have done with acronyms i try to do with aphorisms and is this krishna using all of us to try to try to you know draw more and more people to him and most importantly draw us to him keep us engaged in some way so that we move closer to him yeah it's interesting how you talk about um and we can feel it when you speak the 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 rasa that you're deriving from your study of the gita and i want to ask you this question because the gita is mainly seen as a book of tattva a book of philosophical truth a book which outlines who we are who is god and how we connect with god when we think of rasa then generally we're thinking of the bhagavatam you know muhura ho rasika you know is the rasamalayam the bhagavatam is the place where you can um experience the rasa of the personality of godhead so i want to ask you like um uh, people primarily see the the gita as a book of tattva spiritual truth spiritual philosophy um and later on we 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 turn to the bhagavatam where we find out about krishna's name fame form qualities pastimes and it, and it, and it really that rasa that relish but do you think the gita is also a book of rasa you you've been uh, 
I know you've been looking at the Gita, not just at the philosophy, but trying to understand the personalities behind it. Um, and so does the Gita also give you a sense of uh, insight into Krishna's character, his uh, personality? It gives you some relish of rasa in that way. I don't know if you can say something about that. Yes, that's a beautiful thought. Thank you for raising this point. For me, one of, one of the most illuminating contemporary approaches to the Gita was uh, Garuda Prabhu's uh, your, The Beloved Lord's Secret Love Song. And there he focuses on how there are Krishna's moods manifested through particular verses. Krishna is sometimes angry, Krishna is sometimes concerned, Krishna is sometimes uh, annoyed. And these are very sweet inferences which are insights into the psychology that is going on. So I found that I found that book particularly illuminating. But then once I was giving two series talks at the same time. One was a, a series on the Mahabharat, and the other was a series on the Bhagavad Gita. And at that time it struck me. I was speaking on Krishna and Arjuna in the Mahabharat. And then I, I was speaking, especially in the first chapter in the Bhagavad Gita. And in the first chapter, there was Arjuna. So when he was speaking on Arjuna, so what happened was that how Arjuna was thinking, how Arjuna was reflecting, how Arjuna was acting. I, I found that there were remarkable correlations that could be drawn. I started thinking that you know, how much is the Krishna-Arjuna relationship and how much are the aspects of their relationship playing into the Bhagavad Gita? And that led to an amazing, quite, a, I would say, one of the most delightful phases of study in my, in my spiritual life. So I went to the Mahabharata, all the places that Krishna and Arjuna discussions are going on. Then there are many questions that came up and I found answers to them. Say, for example, now Arjuna is fighting against the Kauravas in Kurukshetra. Now, when he comes in between the two armies and sees, two, sees the two armies, he has fought against that uh, army before. At Virat, there was no, he was not overwhelmed at that time. He was not shaken at that time. Uh, why is he shaken now? That is one of the articles in Radishing Bhagavad Gita. That It is that actually, in one sense, if the, if the odds were a matter of concern, and the odds were much worse for him in Virat, because he was all alone. He has his, his brothers, he has an army. But, the, the odds were not worse, but the stakes were worse. There Arjuna had no intention to kill the Kauravas. He just wanted to teach them a lesson. He still hoped that some peaceful solution would come out. But here at Kurukshetra, one side would not go back alive. The stakes were much higher. Now, this particular insight, uh, I found it, it, it helped, you could say, uh, understand Arjuna as a person better. And if I had not read the Mahabharata and then not read the Gita, I wouldn't have thought of this. So similarly, so Garuda Prabhu focuses on Krishna's personality as it is revealed in the Bhagavad Gita. I focus on how Krishna Arjuna's relationship comes out. And there are many, I am hoping to write a book on, on the Prabhupada says in one purport that Krishna is the Krishna is the ideal teacher in one of the purposes in the Bhagavad Gita. So I hope to take that statement as a, like, a, like a seminal statement and demonstrate to the conversation of the Gita how Krishna exhibits ideal teaching skills. And then we take that framework. Dutta Karma Prabhupada once told me that you know, he sees Prabhupada's books as filled with buried jewels. The underground treasure of buried jewels. So if we dig deep enough, we find a jewel and one jewel may be enough to enrich us for our entire life. So he said that he read Prabhupada's book several times and he found that Prabhupada did emphasize scientific outreach a lot. And he took that as his life's mission and that's what he's been doing. And he achieved a significant amount of success by Krishna's mercy, by Prabhupada's mercy. So I see that Prabhupada has talked about the Gita extensively. Prabhupada made the Gita the basis of his outreach. Now, I have not been able to 
find a written source for this, but several senior Prabhupada disciples told me that once Prabhupada was asked if he were alone on an island trapped, which book would he want with him? And Prabhupada had said Bhagavad Gita. I would, I would like to find a written source for it, but I haven't yet found it. But it's, it's reasonable because uh, Prabhupada did say that when he was asked which books he would like to comment on again, he did say Bhagavad Gita. He did not say that I would like to comment on Chaitanya Charita Amrut again. He did not say I would like to comment on Nenodi. He did say that I would like to comment on Bhagavad Gita. So yes, the Bhagavad Gita has, has a lot of personal elements. Of course, there is philosophy. But when we see it in the light of the relationship between the two of them, between Krishna and Arjuna, then we start seeing that actually it's, so it's, a, it's an expression of their love. And it's like say, two, two devotees are discussing some philosophy. You might find it interesting. But if we know both the devotees personally, and then we say, okay, this devotee is making this point, and this devotee is making this point. And okay, this, this is how they think. Now they want to make this point. Okay. So when we know the two of them personally, we know the two of their relationship, then that brings a special flavor to their philosophical discussion. So I feel the Gita is a way to not just understand the teaching of Krishna, it's also the way to understand Krishna as a person. And that is what is shown at the end of the Gita. In 1876 and 77, first in 76, Sanjay, both Sanjay says, I am thrilled. But first he is saying that Rajan Samsukta Samsukta Sambadami Madhbhutam Keshava Arjuna Yopunyam Vishyamacha Muharmu. He says, I am remembering the conversation and I am thrilled. But then the next verse he says, Tatya Samsukta Samsukta Rupavatya Adhbhutam Hare Vismayome Mahan Rajan Vishyamacha Puna Puna. He says, as I contemplate the message, I cannot but contemplate the person. Person is talking about the form. And we could say that he is referring to the Virat Rupa, but he is also referring to the form that revealed the Virat Rupa. So, for, for Sanjay, his thrill moves from the teachings to the teacher, from the Gita to Krishna. And I find that as our relationship with the Gita will evolve, then yes, the teachings are important, but the teacher becomes just as, as, if not more important. And yes, then there is definitely a lot of rasa in the Bhagavad Gita. And would you say the same is true for Srila Prabhupada's writings, that in the beginning when we're hearing Srila Prabhupada's writings, then we're very much drawing on his Beautiful. teachings. And, uh, but later on, when we read different purpose conversations, and then why he said this in this circumstance, but this in this circumstance. We're, we're not just hearing the philosophy that Srila Prabhupada is giving, but we're actually learning about Srila Prabhupada's heart, his personality, his qualities, how yeah, he's... Yeah. Um, that is so true. Thank you for bringing this point, bro. I was just in Lachua. I was talking with one senior Prabhupada disciple. And he was... Uh, I was talking with him and... Maybe I'll, I'll invite him for a podcast and he will himself say this, but I wouldn't want to use his name right now. So he's, I asked him, you know, what is the greatest, uh, what could be the greatest strength for Prabhupada's movement and what would be the greatest danger? He said the greatest strength would be understanding Srila Prabhupada. And he says the greatest danger is quoting Srila Prabhupada. Srila Prabhupada said. <laughs> so, you know, we can weaponize Prabhupada's quotes to, to fulfill our own agendas. Agenda is a negative word, but to reinforce our own conceptions. And that's not wrong if we are not being exclusivist. Okay, this is my understanding. This is their understanding. So what, what happens is that there is the point and there is the point of the point. So there's a particular, particular point being made and there's a purpose why the point is being made. So initially you focus on the five points and you find them, yeah, this is, this is nice. This is interesting. This is insightful. This is great. But after some time, when we read Prabhupada's books, we're not just seeing the point, we're seeing the point in the light of the person. And what is Prabhupada's mission? Prabhupada started a society for Krishna consciousness. So we see the point in the light of the purpose of the point. Mm. So you could say there's a point, then there's a purpose, and there is seeing the point in the light of the purpose. And I feel we, when the purpose is best understood when we have read about Srila Prabhupada 
when we have heard about Srila Prabhupada as a person and then we have understood his mission. So yes, the way we may read Prabhupada's teachings, Prabhupada, read Prabhupada's books in our first uh, first two, three years in Krishna consciousness, the first five years in Krishna consciousness. And the way we may read in after first after 10, 15 years, it's very different. And I find that uh, every time I read Lila Amrut, Lila Amrut is one of the books I keep reading regularly. In general, Prabhupada's biography, Lila Amrut. After every time I read Lila Amrut, after that, when I read Prabhupada's books, I have able to see them in a very different light. Same Bhagavad Gita. If the memory of the person Shri Prabhupada is strongly in my mind, then when I read the Bhagavad Gita, it's 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 not Bhagavad Gita as it is, and it is not just uh, philosophy. It is a person speaking to me and when we know the person then we can uh, we can make sure that we understand the point in the light of the purpose of the point yeah beautiful beautiful it's really about someone who asked me just a few days ago they said how do we teach the absolute truth and at the same time be um, sensitive to to the person we're speaking to. And it was quite an interesting question because it was almost as though they juxtaposed theological accuracy and human sensitivity. And what kind of occurred to me was that when we understand the theology deeply and we have a very pure motivation then preaching the absolute truth and being humanly sensitive, I think they seamlessly integrate. Um, yeah. And so... Uh, beautifully sorry, put. You to, yeah. Uh, beautifully yeah, so I was just... I, I just thought, it, because the absolute truth is beautiful. The absolute truth is illuminating. The absolute truth is sensitive. But I think when we understand the abs or misunderstand the absolute truth, or when we have some ulterior motive, then preaching the absolute truth actually becomes the opposite. But when we deeply imbibe it, then then that absolute truth will see it, it, it integrate seamlessly with being empowering and illuminating like that. Mm, true. Actually, this is where I see sir. Anudvega karam vakyam satyam prihitam chet. Krishna talks about discipline of speech, a study of speech, or discipline of speech. He's saying anudvega karam and satyam. He's not seeing the two as contradictory, he's saying that both of them are integral parts of effective speaking. So, yes, and how does that come about? As, uh, if, we, if we focus on the purpose, then both work together, just like a doctor. A doctor's purpose is to heal the patient so that in the future, the patient has better health. But the doctor also doesn't want to hurt the patient right now more than necessary. So, so that's why there is some pain medication. But there is also the cure. So I think that uh, theological accuracy, if somebody says in terms of making sure that a person gets the clear, conclusive understanding so that the person can develop love for Krishna and attain the highest level of Krishna consciousness. That is so important. But at the same time, where they are, if their present conceptions are different, are in opposite, then we cannot just destroy their present conceptions. I see it like, suppose somebody is, uh, somebody is living in a ramshackle house, which may collapse at any time. Now, we may want to give them a better house, but if we just go in with a bulldozer and say, I'm going to destroy your house, you will say, I'll build a better house for you. Oh, we have to first earn their trust. Otherwise, they will oppose us. They will not accept the house here. And so, whatever be the conceptions a person presently has, even if those conceptions are wrong conceptions, they are like the house they are living in right now. Conceptual house. And we want to give them a better house to live in. But if we just demolish the house that they are presently living in, then they, they, may, they may, if we have not earned their trust till then, what will happen is first they will oppose the demolition and after we demolish they may just go away from us and then what we have done is we have rendered them homeless we have not given them a better home we have rendered them homeless so 
ಅಟ್ಲೀಸ್ಟ್ Yes, we are our time is going and I'm going to ask you some quick fire questions and um maybe I will ask the question from a different perspective just to see what it may draw out if I was to ask you what are the three main reasons that devotees what are the three main reasons that devotees for devotees who may not be able to connect deeply with the gita why why do you think why do you think devotees don't or may not feel connected to the gita or feel like they're deriving that inspiration or that insight from the gita what would you say three observable things that you've seen which may yeah. block that connection yeah. it's seen as too basic it's seen as too philosophical and it's seen as too repetitive so that's why that's why those are three main reasons and i think all three can be addressed it's basic but it's not just basic there are layers and levels of meaning it's philosophical but it's not just philosophical it's also personal it's a personal reciprocation with krishna and arjuna and it's repetitive but actually prabhupad says repetition is a good thing so it's repeating but from different perspectives so if you start seeing okay at this point And there's a beautiful example for repetition ultimately all music is made of the seven swaras only but it's just the way they bring them together it can produce very different sounds all languages all english languages are just 26 letters but how they come together that's different so so those just are my one repetition one devotee once gave a, a a nice metaphor he said the gita is a song and every song has a chorus and so what you'll find in the really gita heard. is there is a chorus which is which is repeatedly coming up and instead of seeing that as a repetition like any good song it brings your focus back to what the main purpose of that song is that's beautiful i'm going to write on this now i'm already thinking of verses which can be like the, consider the gita's choruses now or themes not verses thank you for sharing that mm-hmm. So this is beautiful people the devotees or readers may see the gita as too basic uh too philosophical or too repetitive and uh when we break out of those conceptions then we avail ourselves of the opportunity to see the the deep beauty of the gita wonderful wonderful um i was thinking when you look at western scholars or the first westerners who are interacting with the gita it seems that more than bhakti the message that they were really focusing on from the gita was the concept of karma yoga or detached work that seems to come out in a lot of writings of um of uh, those outside of the indian tradition that that studied the gita that became like a key message for them um the idea of working without um attachment to the result and and the power of that concept mm. um that's interesting i was just want, wanting to ask you maybe you can comment on that and my 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 follow up question to to you would be uh if you were to share three concepts from the gita which you think are are powerful for the world which, which will immediately give people a sense of the brilliance of the bhagavad gita or the relevance of it um if you were to share three insights from the gita or concepts or um yeah philosophical illuminations what, what would those concepts be okay well as far as karma yoga is concerned this is somewhere i am still somewhat conflicted So there are two ways you could look at the gita the gita teaches about bhakti and that's what it teaches and any reading of the gita which emphasizes anything else is off it's wrong mm, yes as far as the conclusion is concerned krishna is very categorical sarva dharmaan paritijyamam ekam sharanam krishna 
at the same time krishna has himself said that manushya naam sahasreshu and thousands of uh, people few will endeavor to know me and among thousands of those who endeavor few will actually come to know me so those who are ready to approach krishna with the motive of pure devotion full surrender they are going to be rare so for those who are not ready for that can other can others find something in the gita my understanding is yes surely they can find something valuable in the gita the only problem is if you see when uh, in the bhagavad gita only krishna says that going to swarga is a part of karma kanda and that's a valid vedic teaching but what krishna reproaches in 243 and 44 is not that somebody is aspiring to go to swarga go to heaven but na anyad asti iti vadinah that there is nothing else in the vedas except this that is the problem so if somebody draws leadership lessons from the bhagavad gita if somebody draws some lessons for self help from the bhagavad gita if somebody draws lessons about uh, about lifestyle management from the bhagavad gita mm-hmm. i would say that it's at least bringing the bhagavad gita in the horizon of people's consciousness otherwise it's not there at all so the problem that comes is not that somebody feel inspired to focus on karma yoga through the bhagavad gita but that or somebody emphasize karma yoga as a teaching of the gita the problem comes when they say karma yoga is the teaching of the bhagavad gita yeah. is the teaching or the highest teaching it's like in our tradition the difference between brahmavad and mayavad we fully accept that the ultimate reality has an impersonal aspect and we respect prabhupada says maitreya muni was a my, my, um, was a impersonalist shami krishi was a impersonalist and we don't criticize them for that they are respected in the bhagavatam but the problem is that when they think the impersonalist impersonalist aspect of the absolute truth is the highest and everything else is either subordinate or illusory so similarly uh, yes karma yoga may be drawn from the bhagavad gita and it's not bad necessarily as long as it's not made the conclusive teaching so just to build on your point it seems as though karma yoga also would be a more universal message which would relate to all people regardless of how you know pers- some may not want to get into a personal relationship with god in that way or because it seems like a more universal message that regardless of one's theological standpoint can be a very powerful concept to apply in one's life yeah to okay. live a happier and healthier life that is very true you know if we consider in one sense the whole yoga phenomena that has spread in the west that there are many distortions that have come with the yoga yoga phenomena but through it all there are people who have developed appreciation for eastern spirituality and those who practice yoga are uh, by, by yoga i mean physical yoga asanas primarily those who practice yoga asanas they are among the people who are the most receptive to to even bhakti yoga all of them are not so my understanding is something similar now we would not necessarily we would not teach yoga without bhakti yoga but if others are teaching yoga and uh, they are not teaching bhakti yoga is that a good thing or a bad thing that is one of the things i find in the bhagavad gita that good and bad are contextual they are not universal it is based on where someone is at a particular place krishna himself says at one point that to consider that people will label you a coward and therefore don't give up your duty that's what he says in the second chapter of the bhagavad gita that you you'll feel more humiliated than anything you will be worse than death for you but that same krishna later says that be equipoise amat among in pleasure and pain non honor and dishonor be detached from the opinion of the people of the world so which is the teaching of the gita well it depends if somebody can be inspired to do the right thing by considering that people will reproach me if i don't do the right thing that's could do the right thing but if somebody can do the right thing based on intrinsic motivation without needing others appreciation that's better but that doesn't mean if somebody is doing the right thing because of extrinsic motivation is bad so the gita itself has multi level teachings and that's why a one zero approach is not really i would say 
in harmony with the teaching of the gita itself so yes karma yoga is some what some people might take some people focus on sixth chapter of the bhagavad gita and they talk about dhyan yoga that's also not bad it's if as long as they don't just divorce that chapter from the rest of the gita if you consider three of the teachings of the gita which i find uh, most uh, relevant or inspiring today uh, one of them is about expanding our consciousness you know we may have to live with pain but we don't have to live in pain that the arjuna krishna did not magically remove arjuna's dilemma i had to fight against my relatives but krishna gave him a higher purpose for life higher purpose for what he was doing and there was a pain of fighting against his relatives but in the light of that higher purpose that pain became manageable so the gita expands our consciousness of life and its purpose and as it shrinks our problems and pains we may have to live with pain but we don't have to live in pain so that's broadly based on 1858 in the bhagavad gita and the second uh, what i find especially encouraging is that this uh, <clears throat> 1716 arjuna talks krishna talks about satisfaction as a austerity of the mind manah prasad so i find that satisfaction is not just a emotion it's a decision and each of us has to take that decision to be satisfied and what the gita does to it's in the light of the same point which which i mentioned earlier he arjuna could have looked at the situation and be dissatisfied i had to fight against my relatives i had to fight against my elders but arjuna looked at krishna guided arjuna's vision to see not the not the bad that he was confronting right now but the, the good that he will achieve eventually and that's how at the end of the gita he is peaceful nashto sitosmi gata sandeh he has become calm and composed so satisfaction is not just a emotion it's a decision and again the gita can help us to make this decision and the third point which i find is that god is not or krishna is not just a fulfiller of our fulfiller of desires krishna is the fulfillment of desires so he is as i see this is the evolution from 716 to 719 in the gita 716 is where the initially a person approaching god artho jigyasu arthaarthi god please remove his problem please give me some wealth that is we see god as the fulfiller of our desires but in 719 what happens bahunam janmanam ante gyanavan mam prapadyate va sudevah sarvamiti at krishna is the fulfillment of our desires so our so if we let the gita guide us our desires may or may not be fulfilled but our heart will find fulfillment those are three quick things that i can think of right beautiful, now beautiful beautiful i think that's such a such a beautiful note to end on and uh I think we covered a lot of good ground today. We began by talking about the Gita, your relationship with the Gita. We talked about the four stages that you went through in your study of the Gita. And then our first major discussion was really about um drawing insight from the Gita and how there is license and uh, encouragement for us to use our intelligence uh as long as the insights that we draw are supported by the acharyas by guru sadhu shastra and those insights illuminate the sadhya and the sadhana of the gita uh just like our um acharyas have many different perspectives on the gita but ultimately arrive at the same point every reader of the gita can also worship the gita by their intelligence and be very thoughtful to understand uh, what's going on here and then we talked about how the gita is not just a book of philosophy it's not just krishna's words but when we interact deeper we can understand so much about krishna and indeed arjuna's personality through their words and in that way the gita is also illuminating um on the character and the personality of the speakers of the gita and uh and this makes it very um nourishing to one's heart uh we talked about the three blocks 
that may come uh, for someone uh, that prevents them from connecting deeply with the Gita. They see that the Gita is too basic. They see that it's too philosophical. They see that it's too repetitive. Um, but you uh, beautifully unpacked those misconceptions for us. And then you ended by sharing three key messages that we can share with the world um, about the Gita or that the Gita gives us that number one, uh, we live with pain, but we don't have to live in pain. Uh, that um, satisfaction is not just an emotion, but satisfaction is a decision that we can make in our life. And Krishna is not just the fulfiller of desires, but Krishna is the ultimate fulfillment of our desires. Uh, and, and, and this was a very sweet point, which is perhaps the culmination of the Gita, um, where we fully connect with Krishna through his divine words. So uh, thank you so much, Chaitanya Charan Prabhu. You have robbed me of my monopoly of a detailed summary at the end of a podcast. <laughs> <laughs> I, I tried my best to uh, follow. It was quite precise. I yeah, covered almost everything. Thank you so much. You know, we should meet again. Thank you so much. I appreciate like your time. You know, we would like to, uh, maybe in the future when we meet, we can reverse this. And I ask you, I will ask you about your relationship with the Gita. And uh, we can discuss. Sure, sure. Uh, you have done so much on the Gita also. No, no, no. We'd love to hear about it. Thank you so much. Yeah. Hare Krishna. Thank you. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Krishna Krishna Hare 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 Rama